Thank you. Um, so we've got a video clip to start with, it's just a two or three minutes, um, and we're going to watch that, and then we'll just look out for the message that John Wimber brings. I think the context is they were doing a conference, um, and there's been some teaching prior to this, and he's, this session he's going to do things slightly differently. So. All right, we're going to do a clinic. Lay your stuff down. Let's stand up and stretch. Turn around a couple times. All right, let me have your attention. In our Western civilization, we have had a propensity for and a preoccupation with study and the pursuit of knowledge. We, we have equated knowledge, the gaining of knowledge, with power. We recognize that those that know rule. Throughout the world, the Western world, knowledge, the gained pursuit of knowledge, has resulted in the ruling class. Those that are knowledgeable rule. We know that. We know that instinctively. We know that by precept and example. In the church today, we have been conditioned to the same value system. The church today is worldly. The church today is westernized. We're so secularized, we've almost completely eliminated the supernatural from our perceptions. We've come to a place where we don't anticipate God to operate as God among us. We've come to a place where we really think that the pursuit of study is, has become an end in itself which is a good thing. It's not a bad thing to study this book. It's a good thing. It's an important thing. It's a foundational thing. But to study it without acting upon it is incomplete. Both Jesus and James told us that hearing without doing is incomplete. Jesus came as the Word of God. He came from God, became incarnate, and spoke the words of God for all humanity and all, all time to know the heart and the will of the Father. The words then illuminate the heart and the will of the Father. If you study Jesus' words, you can understand and, be, and have the illumination of the heart of God. But the works illustrate. We not only need the illumination, we need the illustration. We need the word and the works. To say I love you and do nothing about it is an incomplete statement. To say, I'll pray for you and not pray is incomplete. To say that Jesus heals and not pray for the sick is incomplete. To say that Jesus saves and not witness to the lost is incomplete. To say that God is God and Lord of all things and not operate as though he is God and as though he is Lord is incomplete. We have been inconsistent in many of our patterns and practices in the church. What we're about to do is invite the Holy Spirit to come. We're going to ask him to minister to us. We're going to ask him to give us direction. We're going to learn to move this week with the, the Spirit of God. What the Spirit does, we're going to do. But he's the leader. Okay? I never know when I ask him to do these things what he's about to do. There was a day that I worried about it. Now I don't even worry about it anymore. It's so much fun that I just... I like to watch people do weird things. <laughs> Because I like what happens to him afterwards. Bring it on. Um, so I listened to that in the car last week. Uh, and it's an hour and a half session. And the rest of it is, as he says, is a clinic. It's, it's practicing what they've been learning about, which was ministering in the power of the Spirit. It's just asking the Spirit to come. Um, now, uh, the reason I chose that clip is that our key verse today from our reading is verse 51. Have you understood these things? 
Because basically what John Wimber was saying was we uh, very much can concentrate on head knowledge. And do I know my Bible? It's the kind of, for those of you who remember the, the EastEnders character, Doc Cotton, you know, could quote the Bible in any situation, but didn't necessarily follow that through in the way in which sometimes she did and sometimes she didn't. She was a, a normal human being. Um, and so have you understood these things, Jesus says, at the end of this whole section of teaching in these parables? Um, and head knowledge without action is incomplete, is the phrase that John Wimber was using there. True understanding is not just uh, what we know, it is what we do with that knowledge. And that's what we want to explore today. Now, Jesus taught in parables, and we've seen a whole section where he's been doing that. We've kind of been jumping in and out of that section. Um, telling stories is, is a sort of a, an ancient way of, of making a, a, getting a message over. We think of Aesop, the hare and the tortoise, uh, Hans Christian Andersen and the ugly duckling, you know, all sorts of different ways in which stories are told to make a point. And Jesus tells these parables but I saw one commentator was talking about this. It's, it's an interesting perspective that we see these parables are told to all those around, and yet it's the disciples that have them explained to them. So there's something about the parables are a, a tantalizing trailer to whet the appetite of those around. But the disciples were given the inside track so they could then go and they could teach. And of course, we see in Acts this idea that they devoted themselves to the disciples' teaching because they had that inside track to be able to explain what the, the kingdom was truly about. Um, so I was just musing. We're going to be talking about our social media presence, what we have on the website, etc. And maybe we need to be thinking about that what we give the outside world is that tantalizing um, kind of story so that they come here to find out a little bit more by being taught what the meaning of it is. I'll leave that with you as a thought. So today's collection is largely unique to Matthew, not entirely. Um, the field story, the pearl and the net are all uh, unique to Matthew. And they talk of the value of the kingdom. And again, this repeat of the story that there is a judgment coming, which we spoke about last week. And we find that in the other parable. The sower, the mustard seed and the leaven or, or yeast, we find in Mark and or Luke. And they're talking there about the growth and our understanding of God's word. So we come back to that word understanding. The parable of the sower, possibly one of the most famous of the parables, um, is actually about understanding the word of God about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. So we come back to that idea about understanding. But now Jesus is, I believe, saying it's not just about your knowledge, it's about how you then put that into action. So if we start with the net, which is at the end, because that's similar to last week's, um, where we talked about the weeds, there is a judgment coming. We need to act as if there is a judgment coming. But the key is it's also about God's sovereignty. God is in charge. If you note that the fish don't choose to jump into the net, they're trawled and caught in the net. They don't have a choice. And what we find in the net is that God is choosing to sort and to root out within that net. So there is a judgment. That's the first thing. Then uh, we can go back and look at a couple of parables about the inevitability of the growth of the kingdom. Note the word that I used there, the inevitability of the growth of the kingdom. There was a survey recently in the Times, I don't know if anybody saw it or saw the headline. Um, the Times emailed a whole load of clergy, um, the, the people who answered necessarily self selected as to whether they were going to respond. There's loads online as well about how the survey wasn't done very well. But the headline was, um, a majority of clergy in the Church of England think that the UK is no longer a Christian country. And you kind of read that and you think, well, you know, even the church has given up. No, no, and no. Because the kingdom will inevitably grow it doesn't matter what's going on in the world. And if you look at history, 
it's not, it's not a straight line. It's, uh, we have high points and we have low points. We have high points, we have low points. You go through the story of Israel, which we find in the Old Testament, and there's two glorious pictures of where um, Josiah, the kings that went before him were wicked kings and they idolized and they didn't follow Yahweh and they just basically got it fundamentally wrong. And Josiah finds the book of the law. He reads the book of the law. He smashes all the poles and he changes everything that they do. And they come back to practice, which is about worshipping God. They've been away and they come back. And then you think about the exile. They were exiled because of the fact that they were not doing God's will. And so they get thrown out of Jerusalem. The temple gets destroyed and they come back and Ezra reads the law. And the pe- they basically are there reading the law, reading the Hebrew scriptures to the people for day, you know, almost a whole day. And they are totally enamored of what they hear and they are weeping the same way as Josiah wept for what they've missed out on. So if we feel that we're in a culture which is moving away at pace from the gospel, they will come back because there is an inevitability of the growth of the kingdom. It may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, but God is sovereign. He is the one with the net and catches everyone in it. So whatever people are doing to run away from God, he will call them back. Amen? That's why the Christian gospel is all about hope. And this is what Jesus is telling the disciples that there's an inevitability of the growth of the kingdom. A mustard seed, small things lead to huge growth in the kingdom economics. And um, the, the, the idea of the mustard seed is it's, a, it's, a, it's not necessarily the smallest seed, it's not necessarily the biggest, there's a bit of hyperbole in, in what he's saying. Um, but the message is clear, that small things lead to big things in the kingdom because it inevitably grows and notice that it says this mustard tree is big enough for the birds to nest it doesn't say a bird or some birds it is definite article it says the birds it means all birds the picture that Jesus is showing is that all nations will be called into the kingdom of God not all will enter but all nations will enter the kingdom of God. And so this is a universal offer of what's available. And then we have this idea about, it was translated as yeast, but uh, a a better sort of word is leaven. And the idea of leaven was that a bit of the old batch of dough is kept aside and then is put into the new dough. And so, and it's through that that it, it, it produces growth. And so it all gets mixed in together. Um, and so the thing about the, uh, the, this little, or I don't know how big it would be, it was 60 pounds is an awful lot of flour, um, this amount of the old dough that was put in, is that it becomes hidden. Jesus uses the word, it's hidden. And so once you mix all this dough together, you can't tell which is the leaven and which is the, the new stuff. It's all mixed in together. And it got me thinking about bamboo, obviously. <laughs> um, we've got bamboo in the vicarage garden. We've also got, um, we had bamboo, we still have a little bit, um, in our little courtyard garden in our house in Chester. And um, I'd, so I looked up how bamboo grows. If you buy a bamboo plant and you, and you plant it, it might be about that big. You, you plant it in, it doesn't grow in the first season at all. And then in the next season, it will have shoots, and they'll grow a little bit taller than the original one. But it only grows for two months, 60 days. But it'll be a little bit taller. And then the next season, more shoots, and it will be taller again. And so it actually takes a while for a bamboo to become really tall. But once it gets established, it just goes, well, it's the fastest growing plant. Now, that's all very well, but what you don't see is the root system underneath. It's actually a community plant. 
And so under the ground, while this very slow, gradual taking over is taking place, under the ground, these roots, are, and I can attest to that because I've dug them up, um, these roots are just growing and intertwining and going all over the place. But you don't see it. It's hidden activity. And there's something of the kingdom in that, that the Lord is doing stuff we can't see. And at some point in the future, he's going to partner with us so that that growth goes crazy. It's called revival. Amen? Amen. So, Jesus is trying to really encourage the disciples that it's not about them, it's all about God, he's sovereign, and they are to be part of this. And then we've got two parables about the value of the kingdom. The first one is the treasure in the field. And it's interesting that the, the person who finds this treasure, isn't, he, he's not out there, he's not a detectorist. You know, he's not out there with his, his metal detector. He stumbles across this stuff in the ground. And it was fairly normal to do that because you didn't have sort of safety deposit boxes and stuff like that. If you needed to... Um, to protect some valuables. You would go out to somewhere in the wilderness, dig a hole and put it in there so that, and hopefully remember where you left it. X marked the spot or whatever. But it's, it's worth noting that the man stumbles, it's almost as if the treasure finds him rather than him finding the treasure. And there's something of that of the kingdom is that these other parables about the shepherd looking for the sheep and it is of such value that he goes and buys the field. He's got to have it. He's got to be part of this kingdom of God. And then we have the one about the, the pearl merchant who finds this amazing pearl. And a pearl, I'm told, is in those days was the way in which we would treat gold now. You know, gold standard was the, the way in which monetary systems were underpinned in, in decades gone by where that would have been a pearl. The pearl was so valuable. And it's no um, coincidence that the gates of the, um, the city of God to come are formed of a pearl because they show the ultimate value of God's kingdom. And he gives up everything to have this pearl because it is so valuable being part of the kingdom of God. Um, one commentator in talking about this wrote these words, if we struggle to respond to God's call, then we have not understood the extent of his grace to us. And when we realize what a great treasure we have come across, it would be foolish not to give up everything in order to gain this. Have you understood these things? Yes, was their response. But did they really? They knew the answer that, that they were supposed to give. But in reality, was that correct? Did the disciples understand all these things? Well, before the resurrection, probably the answer would be no. If you look at some of the stuff that went on, you know, and there but for the grace of God go I when it comes to looking at the disciples, like, well, they didn't do that very well, did they? Peter, or whatever. If we struggle to respond to God's call, it would be foolish not to give up everything in order to have it. And the section closes with these words, like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old, Jesus is coming, we know, to fulfill the law and the prophets, not to abolish them. It is the same, but it's new. There's a new way in which God is fulfilling his promises. And we find that pointed to by the prophet Jeremiah. If we look at Jeremiah 31, we find these verses. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. A description of the, the city of God that we see in Revelation, where the sea is taken away and the people and God are in the same place. There's no barriers anymore. 
No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. And that's a reference to all sorts of parts of the rest of the Old Testament, not least Deuteronomy 6, uh, the the Shema, which you you may be aware of, where um, it says, Teach your children, wear it on your heads. Write it round your doorposts that um, God is in charge. So this is pointing towards a, a time when Jesus would come. Jesus revealed in Scripture to us and by the work of the Holy Spirit is the new promise, but it's a continuation of the old promise that God had always given to his people after the fall. He is a rescuing God. It's a different mode of delivery, but it's rescue, redemption, salvation, and that promise of intimacy with our Creator. Amen. So Jesus is asking us that question, the same as he asked the disciples. Do you understand these things? And by understand, he doesn't just mean head knowledge. He means Do we live as if this is true? And that takes me to Wednesday. Now, Wednesday was the midweek communion. Um, I've already said this at the 8.45. I know this will be recorded, but I'll say it anyway. And Lisa was preaching, and I'm sure it was a wonderful sermon. However, I got slightly distracted. So I just caught Jenny's eye there. So it was a very disapproving look. I was was listening, honestly. Um, but I was sat at the, at the back there, and I got distracted by these windows. I wonder if I could have that slide, please, Richard. And if I would encourage you at the, at the end, if you want to, to sit over there and look at those windows, um, which we see in the chancel. And uh, no, the one before that, please, Richard. Oh, that is the picture. Oh, where's it gone? It's, it's the one before that. Oh, dear. Okay. That's the one. That's one. Lovely. Okay, so there are one, two, three, four, five windows over there. Okay, and they tell the story of, um, uh, of the gospel. They tell Jesus' story from birth to, to death to resurrection. And I was looking at that, and I was just thinking that phrase, do we understand these things? Um, and so this tells the story of the gospel. And the gospel is in the center of a bigger story. And I could take you back even further to, um, I think, probably pre, pre-COVID. And we used to have these revival prayer meetings. We meet, meet, met up there. And I was struck by those windows, and I was also struck by the rest of the building. So I, I think I probably shared this with you before, but you probably wouldn't remember. So I'll share it with you again. I just had this picture that actually the whole of Scripture, the, the story of Scripture, we can almost imagine as being in the shape of this church. And it starts up there with creation. Okay, There there isn't anything there, by the way, so you don't need to look. Um, So in that corner, it starts with creation, Genesis, and then we have the whole of the Old Testament story and all the ins and outs and the ups and downs that we see in the Hebrew Scriptures take us from there to there. And then the coming of Jesus, the start of the New Testament. And this tells us the New Testament story up to the end of the Gospels and the start of Acts. So what we have in this first picture is the birth, the breaking in of the kingdom through the birth of the Son of God who is both fully man and fully God at the same time, a mystery we cannot understand fully. And there are angels there. And there's... Mary and her virgin state and all the mystery that goes around that wonderful Christmas story. Do we understand these things? The enormity of what happens when Jesus was born. And then we have his baptism, the time where we see Father, Son and Holy Spirit, you know, the voice, the dove and the Son who submitted himself to baptism. He had no sin. He did not need to do that, but he wanted to associate with us that he was going to save. Do we understand these things? Then we've got the cross, 
He died for our sins that we might be forgiven. He gave himself. Do we understand these things? Then we have the resurrection. It's a miracle, but also it is the root to us having eternal life, that there is life after this life here, and it is a perfect life with God. It's only through his resurrection that that is possible. Do we understand these things? And then we have the ascension. Jesus told the disciples he had to go away so he could send the counselor, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, who would be sent to be with us to the end of the age when he comes again. Do we understand these things? And do we put those into practice? Do we live as though these things are true? Are they true? So that's the gospel. Well, it doesn't stop there, does it? Because Jesus ascends, he sends his Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and in this section here, from which we worship together, we have repentance and turning to Christ and living for Christ and sharing that with as many people as we possibly can because it would be selfish to keep it to ourselves. It's foolish not to, not to want it and it's selfish to keep it to ourselves. That's where we are here. Which means over there, he's coming again to make all things new. Amen? Amen. Do we understand these things? And notice something about that picture of it starting over there and ending over there. That gives you an open wall. That open wall of this story is open to not just the people who are in here, but all those out there who need to know and understand just as we do. Is that true? So that was what I was thinking during the midweek communion. (laughs) Do we understand these things? It's not just the head knowledge. It is putting it into action. And it was amazing sitting in the car listening to, uh, probably it too, I listened to about 45 minutes, of healing going on. Because it's not a talk. Basically in that video, John Wimber is saying, come Holy Spirit, they're speaking words over people, they're coming up. And they're praying for them, and people are being healed on the video 40 years ago. It was the most surreal experience. And they were being healed. So that others would know that Jesus is Lord. But the the story doesn't quite finish there, because um, I was sat there, and I thought, I could use that on Sunday. So I took a photograph of those windows, which you've just been looking at. But I'd just like to show you the the next slide, Richard, the one that came up first. Is Bob here? Bob's not here. I think he's gone. I think Lisa's out. I showed both Bob and Lisa what I'd been looking at there. And I can tell you, it might be a trick of the light or whatever, it might be something to do with the camera, but can you see the light coming through the cross? That wasn't there. To the naked eye. That wasn't there. But this is the photo that I took for today. I showed it to Lisa and she went, wow! (laughs) Now there might be a a technical explanation as to why the camera would pick it up and and we couldn't see it. Well, I don't think that matters. I think that's a sign. Can you see the cross shining down on us? Do we understand these things? So I encourage you to go away and to think not only about what we've spoken about, what is the gospel, and not to say, yes, I understand that to be the gospel, but to ask the question, what does that therefore mean to me? How will I live my life differently knowing this knowledge? And it might be to share with others. It might be the way in which we live our lives. 
as ourselves. It might be about how we treat people. It might be about a number of things. But whatever it is, when Jesus asks that question, do you, do you understand these things? Let our answer not just be yes as a knee-jerk reaction because we know that's what Jesus wants to hear. But truly, yes, I understand this and I want to be your disciple. Lead me into what it is that you have for me. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that your son taught in stories and parables. We thank you that they challenge us as well as encourage us. We thank you that your kingdom is inevitably going to grow and is growing. Help us to partner with you in what that looks like here. Teach us again what your gospel good news is. And help us as a church to be a body that shares that with others. Those who do and those who encourage those who do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.